Okay, Barbara, we are live. Hello, everyone. And in keeping with the spirit of the half-life of Valerie Kay, let me say Dobri Dane or Dobri Vetcher, depending on what time zone you are in. I'm surely going to exhaust all my Stanford University Russian here, Natasha, but I thought I could at least say good day and good evening. Um, uh, and yes, I'm going to ask you. Well. <laughs> yep, I'm going to ask you how you are. If I, I think I have it right, Kakti Pishvayetsi, and you can say Ochin Harasho. Ya Ochin Harasho, ya Ochin Harasho, Kanietsna da. Excellent. Ya Nichiva. Well, I I understand. What is it? Pinyamayo. Ya Nichiva Pinyamayo is what I used to say, meaning I don't understand anything. <laughs> yeah, right. More or less. But anyway, now that we're in the spirit of this. Um, we are going to be talking about Valerie K. And I should say, for those of you who are wondering, that Valerie with a Y is actually a Russian male name. Um, and I'm not too sure. Is there a is there an English equivalent for Valerie? Yeah, or is we it just are Valerie. It's just Valerie, yeah. You don't hear men called Valerie too often, though. Yeah, sure. Um in, in Russian it's Valerie. Um, so they do pronounce it slightly differently. So right. yeah, you can you can hear it. Yeah. So in preparation for this wonderful story that you have written, I know that you did a lot of research, a deep dive, in fact, into um, Russian prison camps and Russian science and all the rest of it. Um, but did you actually review any Russian yourself? Yeah. Um, so I. I tried. <laughs> I wrote this over the pandemic. So um, in the country that I was in, I, I live in the UK, we had three lockdowns fairly consecutive and I wasn't able to go to Russia. Um, so I joined a language school in Moscow online um, and I learned Russian uh, for two lessons a week, three hours each, um, with lots and lots of homework in between. Um, so I ended up with, uh, you know, kind of uh, okay, I could sort of limp by if I were to go to Moscow now. And I hope that at some point I will be able to, but I'm, I'm not satisfied with the amount that I managed to learn. It was, it was passable, um, as, you, as you can hear, but it's, it's not amazing. Well, I only, I only asked because obviously you had to do a lot of research for this book. And I wondered if you had to look at original Russian sources. Um, you know, and to do that, you have to have some faint grasp of Russian in order to, you know, get into it. You're exactly right. So we're very lucky in that an awful lot of Soviet documents have been translated. The difficulty with reading translated documents is when you read scientific papers, because some of the notation for things like measurements of, of radiation, um, those, those notations are very, very close in Russian, and they're often they often the writers often get them wrong in the papers and they're then often translated wrong in English as well so you you get a translation that says oh we have this insanely tiny radiation reading in this place that clearly has tons of radiation and then you look at the Russian paper and it says something different so that's where it's really really useful um but no I have not I have not I have not read Tolstoy in Russian I've read some Gogol short stories in Russian and that's as far as I got <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I did too back in the day. I had a Russian professor yeah. whose name was Ivan Ivanich Stenbach Fermor, and he was a white Russian who had escaped across Russia through Vladivostok and come to wow. San Francisco. And um, there's a Russian community, Russian Hill in San Francisco, in point of fact. And he would take us um, up to parties um, on the weekends at Russian Hill so we could talk to people. And here's the part you're going to love. I, I know it was wonderful, but here's the part you're going to love. I had him for two years and he would disappear on weekends. And finally we asked him where it was that he went when he wasn't taking us to Russian Hill in San Francisco. And it turned out that his gig was teaching profanity in Russian to the army language school in Monterey. This <laughs> <laughs> was it was 1662, and the theory was that if we were going to send spies, you know, officers into Russia to do their work, and now that if they couldn't swear authentically in Russian, 
Sorry, I went blank there for a minute, just the internet connection. Anyway, if they couldn't swear in Russian, then they would definitely be outed. So his job, but the problem was that he was an old man by then and his grasp of Russian profanity was probably not current. You yes, know, and nothing dates you in fact like that, you know, that use of language. That's hilarious. Anyway, yep. I don't think that. Yeah, it was. I know it. I've always loved that particular story. So my real question to you to begin the more serious conversation here would be, was it the pandemic that inspired you to write this particular story, which involves a great deal of lockup and um, some, you know, pressure to conform and all the kinds of things that you Brits and we Americans generally rebel against? Or did you have this story in mind and the pandemic then sort of came along? Which way was it? I mean, so that's a, a really perceptive question. And I think the answer is actually a mix of both. Um, I had the idea slightly before the pandemic. So I started to research before, but by the time I was writing the book, um, you know, by the time I was writing the meat of it, oh, we were in lockdown. And I think that certainly changed the way that I was writing, particularly the scenes where people are feeling very, very confined. Um, so it's absolutely a mix of both. I wondered, because there's a lot of emotion behind your writing. I mean, this is a book that has a fair amount of science in it, and some of the science is really, um, well, one of the questions we really have to address is, is to what purpose science can be used. Um, you know, was the Nazi study of eugenics okay? Uh, was it enabled by wartime? What is it that the Russians are doing in this book with the scientific research that's going on? Um, and I, I, think, I think it's a really chilling book in that respect, you know? Um, and you're, you're in 1963, so we should, you know, we should remember that it was a, a different time. Um, would it be any better today, do you think, Natasha? No, I, I don't. Um, I, I think people are basically people and they can be people in 1963 and they can be people in, in 2023. I, I think it would go much the same. Um, to answer your question about uh, what, what science does and what science should do, I think for us today, or what we'd like to think there is, there's a clear ethical line, which is you do what you can as long as you don't hurt anyone. But in times of war, of course, this is thoroughly eroded and that is exactly what happened in Russia and in Germany but of course it also happened in the states where people were sent people in Nevada were sent to walk around wearing decimeters after the bombs went off in order to collect data and they would hand in the decimeters which said they'd been exposed to a lot of radiation and of course no thought was given to their health and likewise um, the British come off no better than this we tested our bombs on aboriginal land in Australia and told the people who lived there that the gods were angry with them so it's not like anyone covered themselves in glory at this point. Well I, that, that's absolutely true I also you know there's a really good book last year I can't remember the title um, about Marie Curie um, by, there were actually two interesting books. One was by Jillian Cantor, if I remember, and the other may have been, uh, it'll come to me. But anyway, one of the things you realize is that people really didn't understand the, you know, the dangers of radiation. I mean, Marie Curie's husband died young from it, and she eventually died of it, although she managed to live longer than one might have imagined. I think it was Marie Benedict that wrote the other one. But anyway, um, you know, so when you're dealing with something where, where all of the dangers, all of the effects are not clearly understood, um, that might make a, a slight difference. I mean, I think it makes a huge difference. And okay. I think um, particularly looking at interviews with Soviet doctors, Soviet uh, military personnel, an awful lot of them were not convinced that radiation was any, anywhere near as dangerous as the scientists were telling them. Because, of course, there's a kind of class problem there. The scientists are well looked after, relatively rich. And, you know, they kind of did people like Andrei Sakharov, who designed the bombs, got to basically love off caviar if they wanted to. So their assessment of risk 
was relatively low in comparison to somebody who had come up through the ranks and was now an army colonel. So there was this there was this problem about trust and what level of risk people were willing to cope with. So I think you're completely right. People just didn't understand the the amount of harm it would do. And they certainly didn't realize because they were in no statistical position to realize that the effects continue for 10 human generations. There was a Hollywood movie made up on in northern Arizona in part on the Navajo Reservation. Um, I think John Wayne was in it, Susan Hayward, I can't remember the rest of the cast, and a lot of, um, of the Navajo. And as I understand it, almost everyone in that movie died eventually from the effects of radiation because there had been testing and it wasn't like they were sent out there with you know dosimeters to figure it out but they didn't nobody really understood that it hung around in the atmosphere whatever or poisoned the land sure i mean so i i have no idea how it is in the u.s but there is a, a russian nuclear test site in kazakhstan called the polygon which is from polygona which obviously in russian does mean polygon but also means firing range and this, this is where they tested the Soviet bombs. And today, I mean, it stopped, it stopped in 1992, um, but today you can visit the site and there are some rocks that remain so radioactive 40 years later that you can, that you can charge a cell phone by putting the phone on the rocks. Wow. Well, yeah. all right, so yeah. let's talk about people now. We sort of, um, and, and part of the thing I think is, Scary about Ash's book and also the Russians had not invaded the Ukraine. It started the kinds of things that might come back that are somewhat parallel to um, is my internet connection unstable again? I hate it when it does that. Um, yeah, so Sorry, we I just have, like, for example, Brittany yeah. Griner. There's some discussion about whether she. I'm back. Are you? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. I think it's a little bit unstable, but I can hear you. It is unstable. It's very annoying. Um, so well, my point was that there are things that have come along since you wrote this book that make your book uh, a lot more prescient. One is the case of Brittany Griner, who might, having been sentenced to nine years, be sent to a Russian prison camp. And what would that be like for her? And the other is uh, that nuclear atom, you know, power facilities are in the war zone or near the war zone. And what will happen? Uh, I read about it today. What will happen if somebody decides to like nuke the nuke, you know? Yeah. And what will that do? Yeah. Um, I mean, both both of these things are horrifyingly reminiscent of all kinds of things that went on in the Soviet Union. Um, so the, the power plant that's in immediate danger, of course, is Zaporizhia in Ukraine. Um, and from what I understand, Russian soldiers are using it as a base to fire from, which means that any retaliatory fire uh, risks hitting the reactor. And the nuclear, the, the Atomic Standards Agency has just uh, issued a warning that says uh, all safety procedures are being completely broken and ignored at the plant, uh, partly because the Ukrainian workers working there just, they're exhausted um, and they're living in terrible conditions. And when that happens, you get errors. And, and I think it's no coincidence that the problems that happened, um, that caused the blast at reactor four in Chernobyl happened just before midnight at a very, very late test when everyone was exhausted. So these are not, not very safe conditions, these are not ideal. Um, and I will not be surprised if something very bad happens at Zaporizhia very soon. Um, but let's talk about, in fact, the people in the book, because while we talked around about all these awful things, uh, this is basically a very human story with a very interesting, very sympathetic protagonist, Valery K. And his last name, in fact, is Kolkanov. Um, or Kolkanov, which way do you pronounce it? So I say Kolkanov. Okay. Anyway, Valerie Kay. Um, and, and he's just an amazing character. Um, there's a, a female um, scientist, his mentor, who is a very vivid character. And then there's a, a man whose name is, what is his name? Shukin? Uh, Shenkov. 
Shenkov. All right. And he, he is the surprising character, possibly the most surprising character in the book for reasons that we can't talk about. But <laughs> it's a really human story. And I'm wondering, how did you imagine how Valeri's life was in the prison camp from which eventually Maria rescues him? I mean, did you did you read accounts of people who were caught in prison camps? Did you just imagine it? What? How did you do that? Yeah, so um, the opening chapter of this book is a huge nod to one of my favourite books ever written, which is A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by the legendary Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And it was one of the reasons that he won the Nobel Prize. Um, it follows the a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich follows a man who has been imprisoned in um, a Siberian camp called Kalimar, which is where Valeri is. Um, and it just follows him for a day and you expect it to be bleak and foul and disgusting. And it is. But he's also kind of impenetrably, brilliantly cheerful. Um, and I thought that was that's the thing that really stands out to me about Alexander Solzhenitsyn's accounts of the Gulag, um, uh, about every part of the Gulag system. It's, it's fascinating. Um, I also read, of course, Gulag by Anne Applebaum, whose uh, research is incredible. She collates an awful lot of first-hand accounts, many of which are horrifying. Um, I also read accounts by people like Shalomov, who paint the Gulag far less cheerfully than does the impenetrably optimistic Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So it was a range of stuff, um, but... You know, I, I think my first love is always Solzhenitsyn because he just has this indomitable spirit that is just fantastic. And that that's one of the reasons that Valeri in this book is such a cheerful person. And he's really evolved some interesting survival strategies. I mean, he's, he's always hungry, for one thing. And, you know, it's little tiny things that he tries to take joy in in order to keep himself, I think, from just going insane you know you have to focus on the few good things rather than the multitude of horrible things in Absolutely. order to keep up your spirits he um, does he, he has a friendly rat yeah. called Boris and he has every now and then a can of condensed milk that he really enjoys and he makes cigarettes out of crosswords after doing the crosswords so he kind of has small joys and as you say they keep him going Right. And of course, there's opportunity for cruelty from the guards and so forth that they suss out what those little moments of joy are if they're feeling sadistic. But he keeps himself going. And he's, um, he's about a biochemist by training. Yeah, exactly. He's a biochemist who specializes in, um, in radiology. And what got him sent to the prison camp? So he's essentially arrested more or less at random. Um, and this, this was a very common thing that, that happened at the time. So Valeri's from Leningrad. And if you take Alexander Solzhenitsyn's accounts at face value, which I am inclined to do, at some point, the NKVD, which was the, the parent organization of the later KGB, arrested about a quarter of the population of Leningrad. Um, now, no one's telling me that a quarter of the population of Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, had actually done anything wrong. Of course they hadn't. It was about maintaining a quota for the prison system because the prison system, the Gulag system, is what maintained all the free labor in the Soviet Union. And it's how they built a lot of these secret facilities incredibly quickly. They, they used the labor of what they called Zieka, um, the long-term prisoners. And that's where Valeri starts. So he hasn't really done anything. He's just there. And this is one of the things that he really struggles to convince younger people of when he meets them in the lab that he then works at in the book. They really wholeheartedly believe that he must have done something dreadful. And he really struggles to convince them that that's not how this works. Wow, that's an interesting return to feudalism, isn't it? Mm. You know, yeah. where you get forced labor, um, but you're, you're saying that the idea here was that they arrested people uh, in order to achieve a certain number of workers. Um, but what did it, what did they produce in Siberia that was really essential to the Russian economy? Or was oh. it or was it just a way of maintaining a hold on the population? So I think both of those things at once. So the big thing that there is at Kalimar is gold gold mines. Um, there are lots and lots of gold mines there. So lots of the, lots of the gold from the Soviet Union is mined, was mined by Zerka and at Kalimar. But they're also um, they're also 
almost like a captive labor force and they would be sent out from the camps to do other things. So one of the big examples is the road system across Siberia was built by prisoners. Um, there's a very famous, very lethal project called the White Canal, um, Belomor Canal, which was which was entirely built by Zex, and they they died in such numbers that the bodies were ground up into cement mixes and used to make the cement because the bodies were frozen. Um, the road to Kalimara is called the Bone Road from the port of um, Madagan. And it's just, and, and again, that's that's Zek labor, that so many people died making these roads. So they are used for infrastructure. And then if there's a big building project, who gets shipped out on trains? Well, the Zeks. And there is, there are some accounts that suggest that after the big nuclear disaster at the place that I'm writing about, it was Zex that cleaned it up. So thousands and thousands of very expendable people is, is what you want. And, you know, some of the time they're gold miners, some of the time they're just kind of eking out a living in these camps. But what they're there for is this is this big labor force. That doesn't mean that that labor force was efficient in any way. It was not. Um, but that's that's certainly how they were used. So in education, I mean, he's a biochemist, you know, he's obviously been well educated. That didn't protect him? No, not at all. Um, and academics were often sent to these camps because academics are the most likely people to have some kind of uh, critical thinking, anti-revolutionary thought. You were not arrested for what you had done. You were, were arrested for what you might do. And the more academic you were, the the more likely you were to to think of something that's that's out of line. So academics were um, were frequent frequent inmates of these camps. So it certainly doesn't protect him, and it actually puts him at a disadvantage because he has no manual labor skills. So what's prized in places like Kalimar is 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 like actual skills. So like blacksmithing, carpentry, things that have material worth. Academics, absolutely not. Wow. So in some ways, it's a little bit like system um you know when it was the academics and so forth that were sent to the countryside to you know to be re-educated and do labor but but it seems like such a waste in the sense that you know somebody has become educated to the point where they can there we go again where they can be a scientist then why is it that you would that you would waste that i mean it's it's a sorry it's an oxymoronic system Oh, I completely agree. And, and I think the one way to think about it is to, to say, well, it's only wasteful if your priority is technological advancements and all of the things that, that we like to prioritize. It's not wasteful if your priority is to maintain um, an authoritarian government in the state that it currently sits. Um, there's also, of course, the problems of class that we mentioned earlier. The more rarefied and the more academic your existence, the less working class you are. And of course, in a in a in a society that's recently had a socialist revolution, that makes you morally suspect in a way that a farmer is less morally suspect. It's interesting to me looking over, you know, various communist governments, because communism is really a kind of, you know, it's a utopian concept that, as far as I can tell, with the exception of one place in India, the name of which I can't recall, um, it, it leads to authoritarianism every single time. I, I think with any um, very sudden revolutionary change, you you will get authoritarianism. It's, it's too much changing too quickly. Um, it's it's very difficult for it not to go like that, I think. And um, but I think that's one of the really interesting things about about communism because I really felt like I was writing dystopia when I wrote this book. But at the, as Margaret Atwood says, at the heart of every dystopia is a utopia. There is an idea that was communism, and it was a great idea. It just turned out that under Stalin, it didn't work. Well, but it hasn't worked under Ceausescu, or you know, currently we're seeing it not working terribly well in Hungary or Turkey or. You know, or in Russia, it it maybe when you try to reduce everybody to the same, um, which is a utopian idea, maybe maybe one person inevitably rises to take it over. Um, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it does always seem to go that way. 
It does. I mean, I'm fascinated by Vietnam, which was, you know, the United States major communist target um, in the in the 60s, late 60s and so forth. And yet it's the most capitalist society I've been to visit it. It's intensely capitalist now. They threw off, you know, the, that whole idea is almost immediately. And I find that fascinating. I think the Chinese would actually be, because they always were, intensely capitalistic if they you know weren't being so controlled by the communist party i mean the chinese merchants for centuries you know were exemplars of capitalism and the way they work so all fascinating anyway here we have larry and he is surviving in the camp and he has learned to take um whatever joy he can and keep his spirits up and then one day amazingly something comes along and he can't believe it and he is invited to leave the camp and sent to a new place with the woman who was his mentor um, back in his university days. So he's really stunned, isn't he, by this change? Definitely. And it's not explained to him what's happening either. So he's just told that he's being transferred. And then he's just bundled into a car, bundled onto a plane, and then bundled into a taxi. And nobody at any step along the way will say where they're going. And he gets really worried because once he's in that second car after the plane, after they've landed at this nowhere factory town called Svedlovsk, um, they pass a sign on the road that says, proceed as fast as your vehicle can go for the next 30 kilometers. That sign is really there. <laughs> um, and so he starts to really worry about what is gonna, what's going to happen and why do you need to drive that fast for the next 30 kilometers? Um, this is actually based on uh, something that actually happened to scientists at the time. Um, many scientists found themselves pretty much uh, bundled into cars and taken to a very secret facility in a region of Russia called Kushtim, which is where this is set. And uh, the work that they were doing there was so secret that they couldn't tell their families where they were. So a lot of their families just thought they were dead. Um, they were much surprised seven years later when the scientists reemerged. Um, the scientists who came slightly later, who were allowed to bring their families with them, were not allowed to tell their families what they did. They had to tell their kids that they worked at a chocolate factory. Um, and I saw a wonderful interview with a man who found this very inconvenient because he had to go out and buy like really luxury chocolate to give his kids to convince them that he did work at a chocolate factory. Of course, he's not making chocolate. He's making weapons grade plutonium. Wow. I lived for a while in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is um, a place where there was not just research, but at Y-12, the plant, and possibly at one of the other ones, they were actually making, you know, plutonium and so forth. Um, and I remember the, the secrecy involved in the people who worked there, my, my then husband, was not allowed ever to talk about what he did. Um, and, and it created, um, it really, they could talk to each other, but they couldn't talk to outsiders. And so really maintaining a family um, or any sense of community was, was impossible, you know, since they couldn't, I mean, I'm sure that was true. Yeah, I, I thought about that as I was talking to Reese Bowen the other day about Bletchley, that, you know, if, if you signed the Official Secrets Act and you could not talk about what you did, uh, not only when you were doing it, but for years, decades actually afterward, uh, mm -hmm. It creates a, a barrier between you and other people, um, particularly people close to you, that you can't overcome. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's crushing. And I, I think people at the time in, in this place and many other closed cities across the Soviet Union and the US found it crushing. It's a very difficult system to maintain. And one of the things I find endlessly impressive is that main, they, they maintained it for as long as they did. Yeah, well, I I think today it would not be possible um, to with to social media. No, no. <laughs> no, there's no way that there wouldn't be leaks somewhere. I mean, you know, it's I think that's one reason people are so drawn to stories of World War II, aside from the clear definition of good and evil and um, other attendant factors, is that um, it was is that people were able to silo and work. Um, you know, inside the Official Secrets Act and never break it. I mean, there were there were the acknowledged traitors, but most ordinary people took on jobs and, you know, and stuck with it. Um, and, and, you know, that this, that's a whole concept 
that I think is completely foreign to us today. But just, yeah. you know, you'd be offended if you had to turn in your phone, whatever. So I'm not yeah, too I, sure. I'm, I'm certain there are still organizations where, where this does happen. I mean, like MI6 and GCH, GCHQ in the UK are our foreign intelligence services. Um, yeah. I know that they are, they are extremely strict. Um, which I know because I once interviewed with MI6 and had to turn my phone in and was forbidden to talk about anything that I had seen in the room afterwards. Well, I'm sure you're right. But on the other hand, there always seems to be memoirs or leaks. Or, I mean, here in this country, people leave office and they absolutely leap into print, you know, yeah. to talk about <laughs> yeah, all the too. things that we're, <laughs> we're supposed to talk about. Yeah. All right, so Valeri arrives at what's called City 40. Um, having survived the journey, even though he's deeply worried throughout that if something awful has happened and that he's possibly writing to his doom, but he doesn't have any idea what he would have done to, um, you know, to earn a, a death sentence. So he tries to keep his spirits up. And here he is, and he runs into, or he meets anyway, this woman, Maria, um, who, as I say, is the scientist who was his mentor. And he's relieved, isn't he, at first? He's relieved um, he's, to find her. So, I mean, so he's her, he's one of her students when he was at university. So she's his old supervisor. And so in the way of all undergraduate supervisors, he just worships the ground she walks on with her shiny red shoes. And he just thinks she's wonderful. She's the cleverest person he's ever met. And he can't believe that she's managed to get him out of the prison. And he, he just bursts into tears and he's overjoyed and she's a she's an incredibly kind person as well she sort of looks him over and says oh, I'll be getting you some new clothes then. <laughs> um, but what she's running is a secret facility um, that is full of scientists who've been rotated into the institute from all over Russia but particularly a very a secretive institute called um, the Institute of Biophysics in Moscow, which is where all the weapons grade scientists come from, you know, the ones who work on nuclear programs and the space program, that kind of thing. And they've sent students. So he realizes that something super secret is happening very quickly. But I don't think he's prepared for who she actually is and what she's actually doing because he has these warm feelings for and we don't want to reveal that because we're going to spoil the book but I did think uh, one of the powerful features of the story is how delighted and surprised and grateful he is when he arrives at City 40 and thinks that she has somehow rescued him maybe on a personal mission mission you know personal level yeah and, and it's and, and, so, and, yeah and, 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 yeah, definitely. Um, and it's kind of personal and it's kind of not. Um, she she needs him and she needs the education that he has. Well, that's true. But I mean, from his standpoint, I mean, it's, it's almost a mother-like, you know, relationship. And um, I think it, it's particularly then hard for him to recognize what's really going on in this facility. Um, yeah. But then, you know, he meets this interesting man called Shenkov, and, um, and the book goes from there. It has a very surprise ending, which I thought you did extremely well. I was completely not prepared for that. But I have a question. I, I was, even though this is a, in, in many ways, a very dark book, it's so well written that I gave it to my husband to read and a visiting author. Uh, and they absolutely loved it, I think, because like me, they all, they read in part for the quality. Well, actually, mostly like me for the quality of the writing. And, and we were all very moved by it. But they both have a question for you, which is, what happened to the octopus? Yeah, see, everyone asked me that. Um, so Valeri doesn't know what happens to the octopus. There's an, there's an octopus in the book, everyone, called Albert, um, who Valeri orders because you can get any animal um, in order to do experiments on it, but he he wants company. He doesn't want to irradiate the octopus. No irradiate, no irradiating the octopus. The octopus lives in his flat. Um, but when he at the end of the novel, he has to leave the octopus behind. The octopus is fine. The octopus lives with Shenkov's wife. All is well. He lives in her lab, and sometimes he plays surprise octopus in the retort cupboard. It's fine. 
I'm, I'm relieved to hear that. Octopuses, it turns out, are very intelligent creatures, but they oh, yeah. also, they don't live a long time normally in captivity. I mean, they don't have a long lifespan. Um, and so, you know, presumably he eventually met his normal reward, but it did worry us all that <laughs> Valeri had to leave. Yeah, he has to leave behind. everything behind. He doesn't uh, know what happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he has, he has yet another surprise journey. Um, so, you know, it's like a three-part drama. We meet him and he's in the prison camp and then he's you know, taken to city 40 and then he's there and then he has one more journey at the end of the book. So, you know, did you instinctively write it towards a three act drama? Um, you know, that's, that's that wonderful theatrical structure. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I've read Aristotle and yeah, I've read Save the Cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the two things of equal importance in the structuring of novels. Um, and I can never tell if it's just that this is a pattern that is now very ingrained in me because I've just read enough or if it's something that I did on purpose. I'm, I'm not aware of having done it on purpose, but when I finished it, I went, oh, yeah, it did sort of fall neatly into, oh, my God, did I write this on autopilot? What happened? Um, but, yeah, you know, our Aristotle would approve. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a real fascination with foreign and interesting uh, landscapes for your books. Japan has certainly been one. The one time you've been able to come and visit us, which I hope you'll be able to do again one of these days, we were in Peru, which was a, a country that I have visited, was it either two or three times by now, and really admire. So what draws you out of England and to other landscapes? I mean... So one of the reasons that I write is the same as the reason that I watch TV and the reason that I read books, which is to escape from where I am and the life that I'm leading. Uh, I remember when I was at university studying creative writing, all my professors were, because I was like the one working class kid on the course, all my professors were very keen for me to write about the experiences of a working class 25 year old woman living in this backwater in England. And I was just like, no, because I have to live that. And that's immensely boring. And I really don't believe that writers should be prioritizing writing their own autobiographies. You shouldn't write what you know, you should write what you can find out because otherwise you will be a boring human and that your books will be unedifying. And I'd, I'd always had, a fascination with Japan so I went and lived there uh, I went and lived in Peru I've lived in China unfortunately because of the pandemic and the war I've not been able to go to Russia but it was somewhere where I would I would dearly like to go um, and next up I'm, I'm kind of hoping to get to Kazakhstan so I, I really believe in writing away from yourself but it, it comes from a need to escape certainly well, I mean, I think Bristol is a nice city, but I can certainly understand, you know, your your urge to travel since I have it myself. I also think, you know, you're you're a wonderful a wonderful writer with a beautiful prose style, but you're also an academic at heart too. I think you love finding things out, you love researching, um, and you know, your books are they may say that you're working class, but I think your books are really very elegantly written and perhaps might appeal more to, you know, England is so, it's hard for Americans to really understand the class thing in the same way that it's difficult for the British to understand our race thing. And I think, you oh, know, British sure. and I mean, and I, I really, yeah. And I, I feel that there are two sides of the, the same coin and the, the extra difficulty with race is that it, it brands you as a class visibly, um, which is incredibly difficult. Um, in the UK, we do have quite, uh, it, it's not a rigid class system, like you can move around within it. But one of the things um, that you will probably notice about British people is that if they meet other British people, they can peg where they are on the class ladder exactly within about five seconds of talking to them, um, which is, it's a very, very strange thing. Um, di different regional accents mean different things. The degree to which you have a regional accent means different things. And you guys do have it in the States, I've noticed, but I noticed that a lot of people don't think of it in the same way that I think of it. Um, like I once asked someone in New York, what, what is the implication of a deep South accent for you? 
And I was, you know, like, what, what do you think about an Alabama accent? And she immediately went, oh, you know, like rednecks, hicks. And I went, yeah, those are class words. What you're saying is they sound working class to you. And so that's how I would translate it in my head. But of course, so I'm translating it from a very British point of view. So I feel like I feel like we do understand what these things are as we think about them in different terms. Yeah, that, that's interesting. You know, you're right. The color does, you know, the color of your skin can assign a certain societal weight to you. But in England, it's certainly when you open your mouth um, and what yeah. comes. Yeah. But at the same time, I was thinking back when I arrived at Stanford as a freshman, I'm from Chicago. And, um, and television to a large degree is blending a lot of this. You know, there's becoming more of like a universal American or perhaps even to some degree universal British speech pattern. But I can remember but people I met at Stanford would say to me, say car, because the Midwest is car, you yeah. know, and they would go, say car, and I'd go car, and they go, you know, gales of laughter, and they would say, no, 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 it's car. Um, and also, Americans move around a lot. So even if, you know, even if you, like me, start out in Chicago, I have lived everywhere but New England in the United States. You know, I've lived in the South, I've lived in the West, I now in areas, whatever, and it tends to smooth over your accents, but I don't know that we that we assign, you know, Alabama is an extreme example, but if you ran into somebody from Minnesota, I don't know that you would instantly say, you know, that assign a class value to it. I, I Some think of the it's accents really, are heavier, but I certainly do not. Yeah, um, I, I think it kind of, I guess it depends where in Minnesota. Um, and I think it depends on, who you talk to and how strong their accent is, is really interesting. Um, I remember watching Fargo and thinking, oh my God, this is, this, this is what, this is the American class system, but none of them talk about it that way. <laughs> well, you know, and some of it is self, I probably haven't told you this, but um, I lived in England for many months back in the mid 1980s when I was kind of transitioning from one life to another. And I was in London by myself for, I don't remember, three weeks or something in between. I toured all the stately homes. I've been in every cathedral in England. I've been in oh, every mean. national trust property, all the way from Land's End to John of Groats, you know, the whole bit. Drove all those little one-track roads in Scotland. I had a wonderful time. But on my last day in London, no, my second to the last day in London, I was staying in Berkeley Square. And I thought, you know, I really ought to finish up my London stay by having tea at the Ritz. So it's not very far from the Barclay Hotel to the Ritz. So I walked down to the Ritz. And the only thing on my mind was whether I really wanted to spend, I think it was some exorbitant sum back then, of either 15 or 20 pounds for tea. That was the only question I had. So I, want, I went into the hotel and I you know, went up and spoke very politely to the Metro D, whatever he's called. Um, and I said to him, you know, I would like to come and have high tea tomorrow. And he said, certainly, madam, would you like four o'clock or I think it was six or two or four, whatever the time was. And I selected my time. And that was the end of the transaction. I didn't give it any more thought. So the next day, my last day, I decided to take a red double decker bus tour, which left from the U.S. Embassy and wandered all around London. And up on the upper deck, there was this lovely gentleman, a clear cockney who was doing a guided tour, pointing out all the landmarks and so forth. So we all drove around London, the whole group of us up there. And at the end, we're starting down Piccadilly and he looks around at the group and he says, he said, ahead of us, he said, it's the very posh Ritz Hotel. And then he said, and none of the likes of you or me would be going there for tea. But, you know, and, and I thought, I, I mean, really, I had to bite my tongue, you know? And he said, but, you know, some of the posh people go there. And I, I wanted to say to him, you know, well, actually, I'm going for tea. And if you like, I'll take you with me. But then I realized that he would be absolutely miserable. He would be so self-conscious. He would feel so unwelcome. He would hate every minute of it because there is this freezing politeness that can overcome people you know, in situations like that. And the, the, the man who was so nice to me, because I was an American, he didn't have to care about all this stuff, would look at this man and he would freeze him in his tracks as though he'd been struck by a nuclear bomb. And Probably. he was just, <laughs> no kidding, you know, and, but it was a really interesting moment 
you know, when I recognize that, that we are imbued with a sense of, you know, we can do whatever we want. And so it was if only you have about money. whether I want. You can do whatever you want oh, yeah. if you okay. have money. So yeah. here I, I have a story that is, is less cool, but I find very interesting. And it was my first insight really into kind of the, the way that money can be thought about in different countries. Um, I was actually on my way to you um, in Arizona and I got in, I arrived at the airport. I was by myself and I was, I don't know, 28. I got into a cab and I, I looked younger. Um, I got into a cab um, and I, I told them the name of my hotel. And the, the cab driver kind of looked at me and kind of looked a little bit nervous, but but drove away. And I was I was looking at all the beautiful cacti, the saguaro, and I and I was really very very happy and and not worried at all because I travel by myself all the time. And the cab driver started to tell me about a condo that he had in Florida. And in my British way, I went, "What are you doing, you?" boastful prick that's a very strange thing to be doing and he kept going on about how much money he had and how much he'd earned in the last year and how he and his family were like good people and I sat back and I sort of went what he's doing is telling me that because he has money he's trustworthy and I got out the cab and I kind of wandered around Scottsdale for a long time in this weird days because that is not something that's in my culture at all well, I don't think I've ever ridden a taxi where the man was telling me about, but you know, what's really changed that is the Uber and Lyft thing, um, you know, the gig economy. And my husband, for whatever reason, is driven whenever we get an Uber to ask the driver what his real job is, because, you know, it's a, it's a, a gig thing. And interestingly enough, we get some amazing stories, but the great majority of them are people because we're in somewhere like Seattle or San Francisco, you know, we're not out in the country. The majority of these people actually have a decent daytime job and earning a good salary, but they are living in a city where the cost of housing is so exorbitant that they are taking, um, don't do that again, there it goes. They're taking an extra, um, you know, extra work just in order to pay for their housing. So, you know, you're right that money is a, it's true. If I didn't have the spare money, I would not have been going to the Ritz. But then that and would have been my calculation, kind of, would have been, you yeah, know, I can't and, afford it. Right. And, and that's kind of what the British class system crystallizes. If you're working class, all that means is that you've never had money and you never will have money. If you're middle class, it means that you probably come from a little bit of money and you will continue to have a little bit of money. And if traditionally, if you're upper class, you've always had money and you continue always to have money. And that's that's the when it was rigid. There was no hope of moving between those or, or not very much. Um, as I say, re recently, I feel like I've kind of disqualified myself. Um, you know, I went to Oxford University. I'm very, very educated now, but my 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 family aren't. Um, and that, this this is not what we talk about at the, <laughs> the, the dining room table in the evenings. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a strange thing. So here's Valeri, where money is actually not a central feature of his life at all, right? It's a bad survival. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Not at all. Um, and one of one of the things for him, um, the, the great leveler is is the, the communist system where everyone is basically paid the same. Um, and that has all kinds of profound effects on his life. It would indeed. So what do you plan to write next now that we've explored Russia and Japan and Peru? Are you going to try China or are you looking for somewhere new to travel? So the next book is going to be about the test site in Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and I just, I couldn't leave it alone. Um, I think it's a fascinating place and I really wanted to write about it. The test site is now open to tourists. You can go there. You can go there with the full suit, with a visor and a decimeter and all the gear and put your phone on the radioactive rock, not that it's recommended. Um, but it's, um, yeah, the book is going to be about a, a very strange mystery, still unsolved, sleeping sickness that struck a village in Kazakhstan. In real life, it, it hit that village in the 1990s and I fictionalized it a little bit more and put it back in time. Um, but it's probably radiation related. Nobody knows, I have my own theories um, and it will, it will come out in the book. Wow, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I hope you will get to go there. 
I hope that you know either COVID nor the war will you know will interrupt this. Yes, I, I really I really hope I get to go there. I'm like, I've heard amazing things about Kazakhstan, and now I feel I must go. Have you ever wanted to do the entire Siberian Express all the way across? So what puts me off is that it's so long and you would spend two weeks in a train carriage with strangers and I don't know to what extent I could deal with that. And because I used to live in Japan, it was possible like you could you could go across to Vladivostok, which is actually very close to Tokyo and then take the train. And a couple of my friends did it. And I said, how was it? And they went, it was exhausting. I never want to get on a train ever again. <laughs> you know, it is exhausting, but I wanted to do it for years. And then we stumbled across a video on YouTube, which I think it was made by a British couple. And they got on the train. And the thing that was that really put me off was not the not the being all together and not the distance, but the cities that I imagined were going to be so local and so whatever, they all look the same. Because, you know, it's like I, I was in China and Hong Kong and Macau in particular before the handover to China. And Macau had lots of Portuguese, um, you know, buildings and culture and so forth. And then when I went back, it's all it's all high rises, you know, it's all homogenous. And that's what happened to the cities that I would have been interested in visiting along the whole Siberian thing is that that's happened there, too. So that that whole local color, that whole idea, you know, that sort of 19th century Thomas Cook, you know, let's explore all the differences in the world. To a great degree, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, no, I, I do agree. And I, I think where you get that local color is when you start talking to people. And it's one of the reasons that I really like learning languages, because there is there are things people just won't say to you in English, because it's often the language of officialdom, it's the language of textbooks and school and all that stuff. Whereas if you can speak Spanish in Peru, you get a very different story than if you listen to it from the English tour guides. And if you're speaking um, to someone in Kyoto in Japanese, you'll get a very different response than if you're speaking in English. So I guess if you were on the Trans-Siberian Railway and you were talking to local to, to people in Russian, then you would get lots of interesting stories. Well, that's true. You would, I'm sure, um, get stories. I was just referring maybe more to the visuals. Patrick, let's oh, call sure. you. Yeah, the visuals very disappointing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really, truly, I was just sad watching the video. Right, Harbin and so forth don't look like I expected them to. So Patrick, anybody been totally put off by this ranging no. discussion that we had? No, I've got some great questions. Um, actually, this one is more of a comment, but she says, uh, this person says, petition for you to write about a working class person who conven conveniently inherits a massive fortune at the beginning of the book, and it has no bearing whatsoever on the story. Nice. Really good <laughs> suggestion. I might try and take her up on that. <laughs> um, let's see. Janet would like to know, um, yeah, why the, the first three books, um, well, actually the first four, why did you switch from fantasy to more of a realistic approach? That's a wonderful question. And I did it completely by accident. I thought I was going to write a book with some fantasy in it. I got to 50,000 words, still no fantasy. And I was going, you know, I was looking under the table for it. Where is it? Finished the book, still no fantasy. And I sort of sat back and went, you know what's happened? Radiation is taking the place of a magic system. And I realized I had to introduce it slowly in the same way as you would introduce magic in a fantasy novel I was explaining it in the same way um, I almost included footnotes because it was so insane and so strange and, and confusing so that that's why it's because radiation is doing that job and I realized that if I added magic on top it would be too much it would be too confusing and it would be very difficult to get a handle on what was going on um, there's a question about, I understand um, Joseph Mengele appears in this book in some capacity. Uh, what what function does he play in your in your story? So 
one of the things that I was very interested when I was writing the character Valerie is to what extent is it possible to be a good person when you're surrounded by a kind of what moral quagmire and one of the situations that he's put in is that he and his supervisor Dr. Resovskaya end up working in the same lab um, as Joseph Mengele as he's starting to do those horrendous twins experiments for which or one of the reasons for which he's so infamous and it's a way to show how difficult it is to do the right thing when everyone around you is telling you to do the wrong thing and he ends up doing the wrong thing and he says later um, to his friend Shenkov well, you know if I were living in Germany right now I'd be being tried for war crimes I deserve this I deserve everything that's happened to me so that that's what that is and so the wrong things become uh, normalized, and rationalized to such an extent. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Actually, I have a couple of questions that I would, as I was listening to you speak, uh, fascinating. Um, regarding your research again, do you do you research kind of as you go, um, or do you do the majority of your research before you start? So that's a, a really great question, and I think very, very pertinent to anyone in the audience who's a writer. Um, I always recommend research as you go. Write a bit, research a bit, write a bit, research a bit, because that stops you falling down the research rabbit hole and feeling the mad urge to have a PhD in a subject before you can write a single line about it. Uh, writing is, fiction is not academia. Uh, you don't need to do it like that. You start in a very different place than you would if you were studying for a PhD. So yes, very much as I go. Do you find that it's a delicate balance to... Uh you know, as you say, go down the rabbit hole and you, you learn such fascinating material and the temptation is to put a ton of it into the book. Is it a delicate balance about what to what to put in and what not to put in? Oh, absolutely. And there's always that temptation to, to you know, to include loads of exposition and info dumping and to just include everything you know. So I did, I did an undergraduate course on nuclear physics in order to write this book. Um, maybe like one tenth of that course went into this book and even then I feel like maybe I included too much um, but you will always need to know more than actually goes into the book uh, because what goes into the book has to be ironclad which means you have to know something really really well so that you can stand up in a room full of scary editors and justify it <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh, um, I let me just intervene and say that I think the acknowledgments or there can be um, a note from the author in the back of the book. And while you have a very short afterward in this one, you do have some very pertinent things to say. Um, and I always urge people, you know, when you come to the end of the novel to pursue the afterward, because it will, in fact, inform your reading even more. Yeah, it's always a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, you um, put it there for a reason. Yeah. Quick, quick question. Um, is is City Forty? Is that the the actual name, or is that your invention of the of the area? It's that's a great question. It's the real name. Um, Gorod Sorok is what it is in Russian, um, which which just means <laughs> City Forty. The name derives from. Um, a kind of code system that was used for secret atomic cities at the time that as, as a whole these cities made up the soviet nuclear shield they were brilliantly they were called atom grads um and they were they were closed places and the way that they were named was they were given a p.o box in the next nearest city in this case the next nearest city in the christian region is a place called chelyabinsk which is notable for nothing except the manufacture of tractors um, if you went to P.O. Box 40 in Chelyabinsk, you could leave the mail for the people in this other city that was actually about 90 kilometers away. Um, today on maps, you will find that it's called Ozyersk, uh, which is interesting. It's kind of a code name in itself because Ozara just means lake. So Ozyersk, the town on the lake, and there, there is a big radioactive lake in this place. So yeah, it's very, very real. Now, how about the title of the book? I'm curious. I mean, that Half Life of Valeri K is a wonderful title, but so many other. I was thinking City Forty would be a great title. It would perhaps appeal to a different audience. Um, but I read somewhere that Rust Country was your original title. Is that true? 
Yes, that's that's true. Um, I called it the Rust Country because in the book um, they speak in code and when they mean irradiated, they say rusty. Um, so I, I wanted to call it that. I couldn't because um, there is, uh, I was told, I didn't know this at the time, but there's a, re a region in the US that's called that. And so people would have been confused. The Rust so we Belt. Changed yeah. yeah, the Rust Belt. So um, I suggested calling it City 40. We couldn't because there was, uh, there is actually a documentary of that name. It appeared on Netflix for about 10 minutes before it was taken down. I don't entirely know why, but I suspect. Um, and actually, it wasn't me who came up with this title. It was it was my agent. And at first I hated it. And when I'm not going around calling a book a stupid atomic joke of a title, um, but I was overruled. And now, actually, I quite like it. <laughs> <laughs> You've come around to it. I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. About you know your first three books dealt with the There was a, a through line connecting all, all three of them set in the Victorian kind of world. What were some of the. Um, of some of your kind of literary uh, inspirations for those books? Was there a certain sense of British whimsy that infuses them? Yes, absolutely. So I grew up reading Sherlock Holmes novels, which is why those, particularly The Watchmaker of Filigree Street and at the beginning, The Lost Future of Pepper Harry, they both take place in this very foggy vision of London. Um, the, the central relationship in The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, which is um, about a, a crazy genius, a much more ordinary person who kind of looks after him and the ordinary person's wife, that, that's straight from Sherlock Holmes. That's, that's Holmes, Watson and Watson's wife. Oh, well, his six wives. He has six wives through the stories, doesn't he? But I simplified. Um, so I was I was responding to that. And I, I, one of the things that I was interested in writing about in Watchmaker was, well, what happens when the wife fights back? When the wife says, no, actually, this is insane. You're going to die if you keep following this guy around. Um, so absolutely, there's the, it's, it's kind of it's seeped in that. I was also, I also grew up reading... Um, Oscar Wilde plays, which I thought were very funny. Um, I remember reading a picture of Dorian Gray at the time that I was writing this. I watched a lot of anime before it was properly translated. I just watched it pirated on YouTube, um, all, <laughs> all kinds of things like that. And I was I was reading the big, um, I was reading the Hyakunin issue as well, which is the, the Japanese haiku collection, the famous haiku. So all sorts of stuff went into that, but absolutely a, a solid foundation of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Do you, is there any uh, chance you might return to that world at some point? So I'll never say never, but what I will say is that it was exhausting to write a character who could remember the future because I had to write books in circles instead of in a straight line. <laughs> right. Um, let me see here. Anybody else weighing in? Oh, um, what about film and television rights uh, for any of the books? I'm sure you've sold them. Anything going on there? So for Watchmaker... Um, yes, the rights have been sold, but when you sell the rights, that is, I mean, as I'm sure you know, that's literally just giving a producer the, the right to offer it to directors. So that doesn't mean that anything happens. So a lot of these things have the rights bought, but they're never made. A nice check so, though, for a little while. It's, it's, it is. It, it's, it's a really lovely thing to have and, and to know that a producer picked it up and liked it. Yeah. yeah but nothing specific yet. No. Let's see. I think that's about it, Barbara. Some really good questions today. There were some yeah. excellent questions. I'm, I'm, well, in all of your free time, so to speak, um, are there books that you would recommend to people watching, whether nonfiction or just novels you've enjoyed? So there's a fantastic nonfiction book called Chernobyl. Um, if you're interested in, in nuclear stuff and radiation and all, all the things that set me off writing this, um, it's by a wonderful Ukrainian academic called Serhi Plotki, and he's actually been on the, the news on the TV a lot recently uh, because of what's happening at the Zaporizhia plant. He writes wonderfully and his research is just exquisite. And actually, it's from that book that I first saw a mention of this place that I then wrote about Ozyersk. So I recommend that book wholeheartedly. It's nonfiction, but it reads like a novel. It's wonderful. There was that popular right. history. What is it? Radium Girls? Is that the right title? Um, was that Jillian Cantor's book? I'm trying to remember. Jillian Cantor wrote this really fascinating that was book. Called the Half -Life. Yeah, Half -Life. it was an alternative life for Marie Curie. But what would have happened if, in fact, she hadn't gone to Paris? What kind of life, you know, would she have had if she had stayed? 
in, I think, Poland, isn't it? She's Polish, I think, which I thought was fascinating, but also revealed how little anybody knew about radiation and about x-rays. That was the part of the book I thought was the most intriguing. Um, you know, in the same way that any, any brand new enterprise or new thing that comes along, later it's easy to look back and see what the dangers are, but at the time, you know, you just forge ahead and hope that nothing terrible is gonna happen, which to a great degree um, is a dilemma here in the half-life of Valerie K which is a truly fascinating book. So I hope we haven't put any of you off by talking about the grimmer aspects of it, because as I said, it's an intensely human story. And you really, not just the octopus, but you really, you really do love the characters and care a lot about them. And, um, and it does have, I think, a particularly interesting, surprising and lovely ending which we are going to talk about. So I think thank you very much, Natasha, for getting to spend an hour with you. If you can't go to Russia, it'd be nice if you could at least come to the United States next year. We'd yeah. love to see you. I would love to see you as well. That would be amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me virtually in the meantime. It's been a real pleasure. It's Your always publisher been. should come up with these uh, plush versions of Albert the Octopus as promotional items to pay attention to. Oh, okay. That's true. I'm going to encourage that. Yeah. <laughs> Buy a book and get a plush toy. What a marketing yeah. idea. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, Natasha, lovely to see you. And Good you, night. as always. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thanks. <laughs>